So the main purpose of the impact project uh, was to develop and assess the feasibility of impl implementing a mobile health application to assess young children between the ages of two months and five years of age for uh, illnesses such as malaria, cholera and diarrhoea, specifically in Enugu state in Nigeria. We identified a number of opportunities and challenges associated with the implementation of mHealth in Enugu state. In terms of challenges, there are infrastructural challenges such as access to uh, consistent electricity, internet access, and also in terms of the education and awareness and training needs of healthcare professionals working in rural areas of Enugu. It's really important that we provide the infrastructure, the support to enable the use of mobile health by these healthcare workers to do their jobs in a more efficient and effective way. And of course, uh, support those individuals in assessing young children to improve patient outcomes. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, I don't know. <laughs> so, thank you very much for coming and special thanks for Juan, because he's a hyperactive people. <laughs> and for supporting this, this conference. Thank you very much. Let me introduce you my, my colleague and friend, Chiara Heavy. She comes from the University College, Cork, in the wonderful island. <laughs> Very wet island. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she comes from, from Ireland to, to, to speak about the, the health systems. And she's working in a very active group in there in Nara. And they are researching on information systems in general, but, but in, they are focused especially on health system management. And yeah, that's one, one of the research groups. Yes, yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, I think the, the best is listen with attention, very attention, and maybe 45 minutes more or less. And after that, if you have some questions or whatever, Chiara yeah, could help. Yeah, thank, thank you, you and thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Alex and thank you Juan for hosting me here today. I appreciate it um, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I got off the plane yesterday and looked at the sunshine and said yes, I'm, del I'm delighted uh, to visit for a couple of days. Um, please stop me. Um, I have a tendency to speak very quickly so I'm going to try and slow down. Um, so please don't hesitate to, to ask me, stop me and ask me a question. So I, today I brought an overview of some of the work that we're doing in, uh, in, health infor in the Health Information Systems Research Centre at University College Cork. So the first thing I'm going to say is that I come from a business school. So not, not a computer scientist, I'm not a computer scientist. My background is business information systems. So for me, the focus of my research and teaching uh, as a senior lecturer at University College Cork is on people, process, technology and data and how all of those four things work together. And for the last nine years, uh, specifically, my work has been in the area of healthcare in Ireland. So this is, this is me in data. I don't know how well it pops up. Oh, it does. Um, so if you can read that, this is my background. This is a little bit about me, um, my personal life, my professional life. So I've moved around Ireland quite a lot. I have been at UCC for quite a long time. I'm lecturing since 2002 as a master's student. I have been doing homework forever. So I've been studying forever and then PhD, and now I have a six and an eight-year-old, two boys, and they're doing homework, so I'm doing homework. Um, and I'm passionate about information systems. Um, I'm gonna move on there. So that's a little bit about me. So as Alex mentioned, um, I'm one of the co-directors of a small research group um, in the business school, Cork University Business School um, at UCC. And our focus is really on, on, as I mentioned, the people, process, technology and data perspective and how we can leverage 
those elements, those things, those aspects of our research to improve the provision of healthcare services, both in Ireland and in other jurisdictions. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects that I've worked on over the last number of years. So the Health Information Systems Research Centre, it's nationally and internationally recognised. We work with a large variety of people and more recently I've been privileged to work with Alex and Nuria um, and hopefully that research relationship will continue over the next number of years. We seek to maximise the benefit of adopting information systems in community and hospital settings. So our projects are wide and varied. Some of our projects are very technology focused in terms of building mobile artefacts, for example. Other projects that I work on are, are much more focused around things like data quality and process improvement. So they're quite, quite a, a wide variety of areas that we work in. Um, our discipline, our department is business information systems. So actually my master's, my PhD, the work I would have previously done would have been specifically in the business space. And actually, I suppose what we've been fortunate enough to do is leverage the expertise that we've learned and developed over the last 18, 20 years in business, financial services, government and pub public sector to develop technologies and solutions for healthcare in Ireland with the primary aim of reducing costs and improving patient outcomes. And actually, I think what I would add to that, um, and it's become very important uh, to me over the last number of years, is supporting healthcare professionals to do their jobs. I think that's one of the key areas that maybe is less served by research and development in the health informatics e-health space. Um, and that's a huge opportunity. We have significant experience working on a wide variety of funded projects and we've been fortunate enough to be funded by the Irish Research Council, the Wellcome Trust in the UK, Enterprise Ireland, uh, SFI who are Science Foundation Ireland, so these are funders in Ireland, and then the EU, FP7 and Horizon 2020. And we're always looking at new opportunities to engage with data scientists, uh, computer scientists, um, healthcare professionals, other information systems researchers, uh, applied psychologists, uh, in terms of really developing our expertise in what is increasingly an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary area. So we recognise that the area of health is hugely complex, so difficult. We were just discussing this prior to, to my presentation um, in terms of patients, in terms of data. It's a very difficult, highly regulated environment, very complex environment to work in. And of course, the problems are quite complex in, uh, in terms of their nature. Um, so I suppose I'm very excited to work as part of uh, interdisciplinary research teams. And we're always looking for new opportunities in e-health and m-health. You keep going here. The technology has let me down. Okay. Um, so what are I'm, I'm I suppose communicating a message that you're possibly familiar with from a healthcare perspective. I'll tell you a little bit about what it looks like in Ireland. So. We're, 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 I suppose, experiencing uh, a, a time where we're moving into an ageing population. So in Ireland at the moment, um, there we're, our, dem our demographic is moving into uh, a significant population over the age of 60. What does that mean? It means that the need for um, healthcare services, uh, long-term care, in terms of beds, in terms of outpatient services. It's expected that Ireland's need for long-term beds in the next 10 years is going to increase by a thousand beds. So that's a fairly significant ask of a healthcare service that's already under a lot of pressure. There are significant resource implications. Um, and I suppose, like most international healthcare systems, we operate w within a very limited resourcing structure from a healthcare perspective in the public service. 
interestingly in Ireland about half our population so close to 50 percent of people have private health care insurance and I'm not sure what the scenario is like <coughs> in Spain uh, and I suppose this is very different to our neighbours, our, our UK counterparts. So in the UK, um, there is a sentiment, and we've done some work uh, on the NHS and with partners in the NHS, where British people actually say, you know, the NHS is a British service, we expect healthcare delivery at the point of care for free. In Ireland, we've, I, I perceive that we've a much more mixed view of that. And as I mentioned, a lot of people have private health insurance. What does that mean? It means that they can get hover, cover in private hospitals and they can also access healthcare services quicker in the public healthcare system, which is a bone of contention. So we've increasing pressure on healthcare to support our ageing population. And I suppose there's a perception that healthcare has come to um, the digitalisation um, race a lot slower than other industries. So there's a perception that financial services, retail, we're much more digitized when we access those services. As consumers, we've very high expectations of how we leverage technology to engage with those services. And I suppose in healthcare, do we feel the same way? Is that same type of service provided? using technology to provide you with your data, book your service, engage with your healthcare professional. Interestingly, there's diverse views on this in existing research. So there, you know, there's the, the kind of the um, provocative uh, papers that talk about, you know, healthcare be lagging behind the era, era of digital transformation. But actually, when we look closely at very specific uh, health disciplines, like uh, uh, radiography, for example, we know that the best, most leading edge technology are used to scan and treat patients in some of those spaces. As an information systems person, I suppose where there are lots of opportunities for improvement is, and I mentioned this, in terms of providing the right data to the right people at the right time. So getting patient data and making it available to patients in a safe and secure and accessible way, supporting healthcare professionals to work in multidisciplinary teams in a way that ensures improved delivery of service to the patient and also better engagement across the team that obviously improves everybody's life, there are lots of opportunities in this space. So I think it's, we're, we're, it's a misnomer to say that healthcare is lacking in terms of technology. There's lots of technology in healthcare, but certainly in an Irish context, and my experience in other jurisdictions, it's the delivery of data I'm using technology to engage these services. And as one very uh, intelligent healthcare professional said to me recently, to link the service back to itself, to integrate the service, overcoming the silos of information in the service. This is where there are so many opportunities. There's a lack of clinician-led and patient-led data design. So we know that there's been a proliferation of uh, e-health and m-health technology. If we look on Google Play or um, you know, any of our, our app stores, we can see there are all these consumer technology, health technologies available. However, when we look at the data for the number of downloads for a lot of that software. What's happening? They're decreasing. And I talk to health IT and high tech startup companies all the time who say, you know, health, you know, there's an opportunity in the healthcare space. You know, I have this great piece of software. I have this fantastic algorithm. And, you know, I find it so hard to engage with the right people. But one of the challenges there is that a lot of these technologies are being developed without talking to the patient, the healthcare professional, and really understanding 
their user need, what problem they're trying to solve. So I perceive that there's a gap in, so in terms of the understanding between what the service, what the patient, what the healthcare professional needs and what IT can deliver. And we need to do more work, better work, user-centred work to actually begin to bridge that gap. Um, I've just spoken with Juan and Alex and Nuria. This is one area that I'm really interested in. So I'm the person that sits on every ethics committee in my university. Um, and I do it because I, I, I'm interested. I'm interested in terms of what happens to data. Um, not in just in terms of data privacy, but also in terms of really asking the right questions about, or more questions even, about how data should and could, can be shared. When we analyse data, when we run algorithms, what, do, what does that mean? Um, is data truly ever anonymous? When we think about uh, leading edge technology such as artificial intelligence and machine learning, what are the ethical frameworks that we can bring to these technologies that really support an ethical view of data? Not just data privacy, not just data storage, but actually the human-centric view to being able to ask really meaningful questions about data. So this is a slide um, that comes from my, uh, the Irish Public Health Service. And actually it's really small, but from a, a public health service perspective in Ireland, there's a lot of work uh, been happening over the last uh, four or five years. And the kind of the, the main strategy is it's called stay left, shift left. And it's based on Moore's law, it's like the Moore's law for healthcare. So at the moment we're, we're over here kind of firefighting, trying to deal with huge numbers in emergency departments, not being able to predict what, uh, who is going to arrive at an acute hospital on a daily basis. We have very long outpatient waiting lists, access to GP becoming a challenge. And this stay left, shift left strategy is based on the premise that if we improve the digital transformation of our healthcare system, we begin to move into a more preventative um, strategic approach to healthcare. So better prediction of um, illness, the need for a healthcare service and specific types of healthcare expertise. So we, we're generating much greater insights into how to better support our ageing population and their healthcare needs. So this is, you know, this is an abstracted view of that. It's, um, you could say it's idealist in its, in, its, um, in its objectives. However, there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes uh, in order to begin to uh, tackle some of these areas. So I mentioned this idea around the, the, the perceived gap, as I see it, between some, not all, of the health information technology that's available and the clinicians, those healthcare professionals that are, are expected to or have a need that requires some technology solution. There we are. And at the centre I call this value innovation and actually this is from, um, this idea comes from, I can't remember which book, it'll come back to me, um, based on creating value at the kind of the intersection between uh, two, an idea and say the cost differentiation of a particular product or service. So actually on the back of this idea over the last number of years, along with uh, are in parallel with the health information systems research that we've been conducting in, in, at our centre in UCC. We've also introduced uh, an, a Masters in Digital Health. And we offer this on a part-time basis to healthcare professionals primarily and some uh, IT professionals in the healthcare space. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes. So this, the idea is that it's a simultaneous pursuit of value through leveraging technology in the health domain and really trying to close the gap between 
the problems that are being experienced in the healthcare service and those technology solutions that the best and bright uh, informaticians, data scientists, computer scientists, uh, information systems people have. So I just wanted to kind of briefly talk about a couple of the projects that I've been working on over the last number of years. Um, they're very different in nature, all underpinned by people process technology and data. Um, the first one is Expansion Strategy Innovation Partnership and that was a project that was funded by uh, an Irish funder uh, to support work to understand the opportunities for diversification for an Irish Indigenous health insurer. And actually as part of that project um, we did a lot of work on user, a user-centred design approach for an mHealth tool to support our health insurer to think about using technology for processing payments in health insurance. And actually this is back in 2012, 2013, where there were very few organisations doing this. The banks had begun to do it. Um, and really we learned a lot. We learned a lot about the health insurance market, but actually what was even more interesting from a research perspective, we learned a lot about uh, the user-centred design approach, user experience analysis. So actually taking very rudimentary prototypes of a mobile health tool and going into coffee shops and asking people, can I buy you a cup of coffee? Would you mind trying our app? And it might have only been a specific feature of the app at that time. And mostly it's surprising, we we're very surprised by human behaviour. People say, yeah, no problem, show me, let me try it. And we videoed, not at no one's faces, but actually at that time it, 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 it allowed us to devise a methodology or our approach to user-centred design that was really close to uh, uh, participant engagement. Okay? And we've been able to leverage that over the last number of years. So as a result of that project, that project was funded for about €400,000. Um, we supported um, the partner organisation to look at uh, particular opportunities in another European market using uh, mobile health technology or a, a consumer-facing um, mobile app. These two projects are, um, I suppose, complementary in nature, supporting life and impact. And indeed, I had the pleasure of presenting these projects a couple of years back when Alex invited me to visit at a conference here in Alicante. Uh, Supporting Life is a European-funded project, um, a large project, so it was funded for over €3 million, Euro, um, where we worked, UCC, I led the UCC team, and we worked as part of a large consortium of international um, uh, partners, one was based in Sweden, uh, one was based uh, in the University of Washington in the US, and we worked with um, a non-government organisation on the ground in Malawi to develop a mobile health app to support healthcare workers, frontline workers, better assess young children between the ages of two months and five years of age. And the focus of this app was to better assess, to better diagnose and treat young children for illnesses such as malaria, cholera and diarrhoea. And these are diseases that very young children in countries like Malawi die of on a regular basis. So we spent four years working on this project and actually I'm going to take you through kind of elements of, of that technology. Um, and as a result, we also subsequently were uh, funded for a smaller study called IMPACT and that project was undertaken in Nigeria uh, in collaboration with the College of Medicine and Health in Enugu State University of Science and Technology to understand the opportunity for mobile health use among rural healthcare workers and again to better support rural healthcare workers to diagnose and treat very young children in rural communities. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about those two shortly. This final project, just to mention, was funded by the Wellcome Trust in the UK. And the ca CASM is an acronym 
for consenting health data through social media. And actually, I suppose here is where um, my group's passion for really understanding data and ethics, um, I suppose, uh, is, is highlighted. So as part of this project, we looked at uh, user awareness when signing up, registering for a health social network. So I don't know if you're familiar with a health social network. So similar to a Facebook um, or another uh, online social networking community, there are a number of health or patient-centered uh, social networks available to, to sign on. Uh, some of them are very large and growing. They're based all over, their, their, their companies based all over the world. And there's a couple with more than six and 700,000 um, users at present. And these are social networking um, platforms where users can sign on. They might provide details, data about their own personal health, about medication that they take. And based on their, their health and their medication, they're assigned to groups. And in those groups, they can discuss with like-minded patients or users like themselves, you know, if they have a, an ongoing chronic illness, how do they live their life on a daily basis, um, be supported by that community to maybe better manage their, their, their long-term illness, etc. So these are very interesting communities to understand. For this project, we weren't, we weren't interested in what happened within the community. What we were interested in was the level of awareness for a user signing up and registering and providing their data to this social networking platform. So in our study, we looked at uh, users' level of awareness. Did they read the terms and conditions of the site? Did they understand the privacy uh, policies for the site? What, what elements or factors did they take into consideration when they were registering to use the site? Surprise, surprise. People don't read privacy policies in terms and conditions. However, the reality is, so we conducted, uh, as part of our study, we worked with some graduate students, some master's students in our university. We asked them to uh, sign on to a site register, provide some data. Um, we observed how they did that to understand, did anyone actually engage with some of the documents, the legal documents as associated with the terms of use of the site? Mostly they didn't. And then we had a focus group discussions around engaging with these types of sites and the content in the, the documents. And actually it was a real surprise to these, these, our participants that their data could be shared and sold to third parties, including pharmaceutical companies. And the reactions were really interesting. So people were actually quite annoyed, angry, a bit aggressive, had a little bit of anxiety about what they signed up for and the fact that they didn't realize that their data would be made available. Interestingly, in our participants, they were all quite positive about their data being shared for research purposes, which maybe isn't a surprise. So following on from our understanding of user awareness, we developed a digital intervention, a video tool that we user tested with a number of focus groups and refined. And our video, it's a, sh it's a short animation that actually takes the key messages from terms of use and uh, privacy policies and provides them in a clear and accessible way. And that's kind of where we are with that study at present. I just want to talk a, a couple of minutes about, so these are some of the research projects, I'll come back to that in a second. Well, Too much stuff. I'll come back to, I'll mention a couple of those things at the end. I just wanted to talk about one of our mobile health projects, um, specifically I suppose in terms of within the context of this talk. So we've undertaken a number of mobile health analysis, design, development and evaluation projects. And this is one of them. So the impact project, we collaborated with Un uh, Inugu State uh, University of Science and Technology in the College of Medicine to understand the opportunity for, m for mobile health. So 
I don't know if you know much about Nigeria. There's 36 states in Nigeria. Um, it's a, a difficult place to engage with from a research perspective. However, a wonderful place to visit, fantastic place to visit. So as part of this project, we looked at the integrated community case management guidelines, and these are World Health Organization guidelines. So essentially, the algorithm was in place in a paper-based format. And when we started this project, integrated community uh, case management had been implemented in two of um, the 36 states in Nigeria on a paper-based basis, which meant that world health or health workers, healthcare workers in rural communities, they have this large book, it's called a standing operating procedure or a standard operating procedure, an SOP. And in the, their SOPs, they have very specific guidelines if depending on what a patient presents with. So if you have a cough, go to here. So a decision tree essentially, a set of rules. If you've had a cough for X amount of days, move here. If you've had a cough for X amount of days plus, and there are various alternatives to the algorithm. Similarly for uh, the assessment of young children for cholera, malaria, diarrhea, there is, there is a, an ICCM algorithm in place. It's a very detailed algorithm. Um, so what we did as part of our project is we codified that using XML and we implemented it as part of a mobile health application, which we then, this particular project was a very small project, so we just wanted to understand the feasibility of implementing such an application in this context. So we visited Enugu State twice, once to understand the context, I'm a qualitative researcher, to understand the, the context, who would use the technology, how would they use it, what, what would um, motivate them to use the technology. So we talked to a number of healthcare workers, and I'll actually just go to here, to understand, so this is me in a healthcare uh, community clinic, um, about 50 kilometers for the, from the closest kind of city. And we invited healthcare workers to come and talk to us about what they do and how they do it. We learned so much about um, some of the economic challenges in the area. For example, most of the healthcare workers that we'd spoken to hadn't been paid in six months. In fact, the lecturers that we met, the academics we met in the area, hadn't been paid in six months. So it's really significant economic challenges. Access to electricity was intermittent. Access to internet was poor, but actually maybe better than I expected. So we visited, um, my, our, at the time we had a research assistant who was my PhD student and he was from this area. And we visited his family, his family's home, out in a very rural location. We still had internet access, which is quite interesting. What we did learn actually during this session was there had been previous funded projects in this community. They come from the UK specifically. Mm. And in order for all of our healthcare workers to attend, the chiefs of the community also attended this session. And they were brilliant. So rather than saying, yes, we really want this technology and this is kind of, you know, going to improve everything that we do about the provision of healthcare to our young children in this area, one of the chiefs said, the last project group that came here brought us really small phones. We couldn't use them. They were too small. It was the old Nokia phones. Remember the old little black Nokia phones? Too small for our fingers, our hands. If we're going to enter uh, an entire health record into a, a, a mobile device, we need, the technology needs to be fit for our physiology. We would have never known this if we hadn't visited. This is, this is fantastic. One of the other really interesting, insightful uh, learnings from this was after I presented about the project and about the mobile health app, we asked the healthcare workers to talk about how they use technology. 
and in fact healthcare workers in this area because it was quite close to university they were very well educated some of them had nursing degrees some of them had pharmacy degrees psychology degrees they were saying you know we're, we're going on to Google Play we're downloading apps to take um, respiratory rates and other vital signs they don't work we tried them. I'm working in this area for 15 years. I've been doing this work assessing patients for 15 years. I can tell you this app doesn't work. So that's one of the other really interesting things that we haven't quite cracked, certainly in terms of uh, from a research perspective, but actually internationally. The standardization of the quality of these technologies requires a lot of work. This is an area where there are some regulation, but in terms of quality assurance and evaluation, there's a lot more work to be done. So we, during the, this visit, we got some feedback on our own app, explored current knowledge levels in terms of using the mobile phones and the technology to, do, um, to assess uh, a patient. Really interesting one. In terms of, if, if you're working as a healthcare worker for a number of years and you're used to having two hands available to do your assessment and you're being handed a tool, how do you then incorporate that, that technology, that artifact, into your, exist, your process? How do you make that work for you to ensure that you still engage with your patient in a, a meaningful way? So these are questions that arose from our, um, sorry, I keep doing that. Our second visit, my research assistant had to go by himself for this one. Uh, unfortunately, I had fairly significant visa issues, to, uh, uh, so it prevented me from revisiting Anugu. And one of the learnings that we identified from the first visit was um, understanding, general understanding, education and awareness around using mobile devices to do to do everyday activities. So what we found was that healthcare, um, the healthcare professionals that we engaged with had the best technology that money could buy from the black market, the latest and greatest Android devices, 300, 400, 500 euros, fantastic devices. They didn't really understand the, uh, the, uh, the affordances of the technology. So we, we actually spent two days running workshops about using both the technology specifically uh, in and of itself, but also then using the technology, uh, our M Health tool, our impact tool, to understand how our tool would be used to assess young children in a rural healthcare setting. So we deliver training sessions on ICCM, which is the, the World Health Organization guidelines because they're new to the region, on using mobile technologies, on mobile health in general, and what were the opportunities and challenges for this particular area in terms of mobile health and the delivery of mobile, uh, the delivery of healthcare services, and then our tool, the Impact app. And we conducted assessments of our primary healthcare workers, that's PHCs, ability to use the app. So we provided them with lots of different scenarios that they could try and test amongst each other. And then finally, we conducted focus groups to evaluate the training program and explore barriers to using the app in the future. The other things that we, we did as part of those visits was we, we met with the Commissioner for Healthcare in the state. We met with a number of government officials. We, we weren't able to access um, the governor uh, during our visits, which was, which was a, a little bit disappointing. Um, so we got an opportunity to engage with decision makers around what, what would it take to implement mobile health, not specifically our app, but mobile health in this area in order to improve the provision of healthcare services in an area where it was very difficult to engage uh, physicians to actually be located permanently out in rural areas. We interviewed them. We also talked to academics and trainee doctors to understand their perceptions, their attitudes, identify some of the opportunities and challenges associated with bringing mobile health to their area. So here's some of the findings, and some of them are not very surprising. The lack of resources, shortage of staff, time pressures. So the, 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 this book that our healthcare professionals use um, were really labour intensive, really long. One of the curious 
findings from our studies when we visited rural health centres, they couldn't even find this big book, which was kind of concerning. Um, so using that as a tool to conduct their assessments and the lack of training. So the healthcare professionals we spoke to, our, our, our primary healthcare workers were saying, we haven't been trained on even the latest World Health Organization guidelines in you know, many years. Primary healthcare workers and stakeholders expressed positive views. They thought this was a great idea in principle, but actually operationalizing it in terms of technology, infrastructure, training, access to phones, and supporting that over time was going to be a real challenge. Uh, the knowledge levels really varied across the different primary health care workers that we engaged with. So some were highly proficient in using technology and others really struggled to use their mobile phones. Um, so challenges facing the app, gaining support from end users in the community. So one of the surprising, I suppose, differences in our studies in Nigeria compared to the work we'd done in Malawi was that in Nigeria, people said, mm, I'm not sure, uh, can I try your app? And they came back and they had, they had really interesting suggestions about improvement, about changes. They weren't immediately accepting that this was the right tool for them. And, and actually, that's re that really, I suppose, challenges some of the work we'd done in Malawi, where people said, oh, great, you know, give us the technology, we'll use it. And almost they were afraid to be negative about the technology in case it wouldn't be implemented. So there was certainly differences, and we haven't, we haven't explored that. Um, some of the opportunities we need to discuss the challenges with health leaders and, and, and stakeholders. There was a significant difference in terms of perspective. We talked to the decision makers at government level and they, um, they were very optimistic about the infrastructure they had available and what they could do on the ground with those front, frontline workers. It was a real challenge, particularly when they hadn't been paid in a long time. Um, the app, in terms of technology, one of the challenges around M Health and the R tool is that the guidelines are changing all the time. So how do we build tools that can adapt and flex according to the changing rules, the changing best practice uh, in terms of how we assess patients and treat patients? Um, and that's a, a future challenge for our group. Uh, we've done a lot of training and scenario building and this is a really great way of building capacity on the ground in these countries um, and we have I suppose learned a lot about developing and communicating strategies to overcome some of the challenges that we've encountered however connectivity is a big issue and actually access to a consistent supplier, power supply is a big issue in these in this area I just want to I'm gonna actually I've spoken for far too long which is typical for me. So I'm going to go back a bit here. I, I can give you the slides if you want to uh, share them. So I just mentioned one project um, that we've, we've closed and completed in terms of the funding, but we're looking for additional uh, funding to further that project with great collaborators and partners that we have, uh, mm -hmm. have built in uh, Nigeria. In terms of some of the work kind of more recently, um, and, and this is coming, I suppose, in parallel with the MSc in digital health that I, I now run. So we're coming to, we have 17 healthcare professionals who are, are completing their masters as we speak. So they're writing research uh, papers, articles on uh, outpatient scheduling, using predictive analytics techniques for outpatient scheduling, scheduling. Um, understanding a user-centred approach to uh, nursing education using mobile health, um, understanding uh, the opportunities to implement uh, a national patient summary in out-of-hours primary healthcare services. So the, the projects are wide and varied and they're very applied. So they're specific to the opportunities and challenges experienced by healthcare professionals in a variety of settings. So some opportunities for digital health as I see them at the moment. 
There's an opportunity to create efficiencies by reducing the amount of time gathering and communicating patient information or patient data. This is a real challenge and it, it also supports um, better ways to enable healthcare professionals to work together. This is coupled with, as I see it, improved service integration across healthcare services community, primary, tertiary and allied health services. And I can give you an example of this. So at the moment I'm working with a small group of people, we're trying to find funding in an acute public hospital to support multidisciplinary teams, so um, doctors, speech and language therapists, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, dietitians, the multidisciplinary team than a, that a patient with a chronic condition might have, in terms of providing or offering a single referral out to community services. So I don't know if you've experienced or have a family member or know someone who has experience in dealing with the healthcare service. There is a significant lack of integration when you move from the hospital out to the community and from the community back into the hospital. Um, in terms of technology, our community services in Ireland uh, are really struggling to um, find the resources to uh, develop and build and implement technologies to enable some of this good stuff to happen. So we're working on understanding what processes currently are in place. And actually, in my experience in this one hospital, a discharge occurs by every single, so every single professional discharges an individual patient separately, using separate paper-based forms. Going, sometimes going to the same community service, and sometimes going to different community services. This is time consuming. It is highly subjective to errors and omissions, duplications, and it has an impact on how the team communicate with one another. So this is one really tricky problem, really challenging problem I'm working on at the moment. We're trying to begin to solve that. Drive service improvement. So knowing what patients are doing and equipping them and healthcare professionals with better tools and algorithms to make more informed and better decisions. So this is a project I'm working on. It's called My Use. It's a project I'm currently working on in a multidisciplinary team in UCC and it's for our university. So it's a student-based service and MyU stands for My Understanding of Substance Experiences. So I'm working with epidemiologists, public health, applied psychology and uh, let me see the health services, the student health services in UCC to design, develop and implement a digital intervention to reduce harm amongst third level students in illegal substance use. So this is work, there is a, um, um, a very limited evidence base for this type of digital intervention. So we spent two years working on the evidence base, the state, understanding the state of the art and doing systematic reviews in motivations uh, for use and the effectiveness of understanding the effectiveness of other digital tools, uh, not so much in this space, but in terms of alcohol and smoking. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of work in this and this is a fantastic project that is going to be implemented to better support our students. Really excited. Do I have something more? So virtual health can support those with chronic conditions to self-manage their conditions to remain medically stable. And I'm beginning to work with a lady who, um, she is uh, a physician from Nigeria. She's starting a PhD project. And what we're going to do is, it's going to be a, a study looking at both an Irish context and a Nigerian context, a prospective investigation of the design of te telemedicine solutions for primary care. So a lot of this work, telemedicine, uh, there's a lot of it being done in terms of serving um, developing countries, uh, specific 
chronic diseases, for example. But in terms of uh, a complete solution for primary care, we've identified a real opportunity in, in this area. Um, and we think that there's work that can be done in both jurisdictions. So that's work that we're just beginning this summer. So I have spoken for far too long <laughs> and gone through very many slides too quickly. Thank you very much for listening and I would appreciate any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions or comments? <laughs> Did you understand me? <laughs> my, my fast speaking? Not yes. only works by rules. Yes. Yes. Yes, so it doesn't That's learn. Not, um, image recognition or other. No, no. So it's based, I suppose this is so the that app is based on World Health Organization guidelines. One of the big limitations is that it doesn't learn. So we haven't built any machine learning capability into this algorithm. This is a huge opportunity for these types of, of mobile health tools. Yeah, yeah. Well, as you probably know, some of these topics are well connected with the topics published in the work program of the European Framework Program. Yes, know, yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, we have to introduce ourselves. We believe uh, my colleagues and I belong to the European Project Office in the University. Are you interested in future collaborations in this type of project? Absolutely, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Straight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me to the audience. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Ideas? Can, yes. Um, uh, do you, from your expertise, uh, do the experts uh, really trust on the, on, on the machine learning and algorithms that provide solutions? Do you know, really I don't know. I don't know. Um, in the work that we've done to date, so the decision support tool the, D, the clinical DSS for uh, Nigeria that was based on an existing algorithm. So this is, this is an easier one to engage with healthcare professionals because it's, it, it, once we test it and evaluate it, we know that this, the decision outcome is similar to the paper-based existing, existing decision support tool. And actually in the Malawi study, which was a large study, we ran an, a randomized control trial. We, we, we used the mobile health tool and the paper-based tool in parallel. Um, and that was very important, it, actually from an ethics perspective, this yeah. was essential. In terms of uh, using machine learning algorithms in the future, um, I'm beginning to do some work in terms of uh, predicting outpatients attendance at appointments. Um, I, I, th I, I believe we need to run some of these solutions in parallel with the existing solutions to, in order to provide the evidence pay base for healthcare managers and healthcare professionals to trust the algorithms. Yeah. It, it's a difficult one. Yeah, difficult, yeah. So I, I don't know is the answer. Yes. Maybe it's the first, the first uh, predictions has been measured and compared. I suppose the other, so we're, we're doing, um, I'm working with a healthcare, he's actually an anaesthetist uh, in Northern Ireland. On a, so it's a scoping review, so a literature review of uh, the use of clinical decision support systems in perioperative scenarios. And we're, we're beginning to kind of understand what the state of the art in this space looks like. But in terms of, of I think at the moment, healthcare professionals, experts, Will, will they use these tools, clinical decision support, AI, machine learning, only to support their own, their own expertise, their knowledge base. I'm not sure, I don't know what technologies are being used alone. Yeah. yeah. That clinical scenarios are critical, the, the, the accuracies of the, the models. The uh, oh, absolutely. Maybe health management, non-clinical, non management is no where the, where the risk, yes. where the risk is much lower, absolutely. Yeah.
Yeah. So maybe the first, uh, the first stage of, the of building <laughs> the trust the y using the algorithms. Yeah. Because it's not critical. Yeah. As clinical. Is. Yeah. No. And actually, I know a group who there's um, there's a group <laughs> in uh, University College Cork called Infant. Their research group. And their, their research is primarily on uh, um, babies, very, very small babies. They're beginning to use uh, algorithms uh, in e using EEG data to predict uh, the likelihood of seizure in very young babies. But it's my understanding, and you need to go and read the research, that they, they are using these tools with teams of, of experts, yeah. uh, neurologists in this area, so okay. that the algorithm is not being used alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're talking about the healthcare, are you talking about the hospital or...? Yes, hospital? so uh, actually we've done work uh, in the community in Malawi and Nigeria, primary care, I'm doing some work with uh, GPs, uh, general practitioners and also hospitals as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, so a variety of, of scenarios. Hey, oh. Nuria. Um, I want to ask you about the collection of the data mm -hmm. uh, with the impact project and uh, those devices more that you were talking about, how the, they collect the data. Like they ask the, because they are children. So you don't, you don't have the possibility to ask them, yeah. uh, do you feel pain? Or how, how they know how to complete or feel the, those uh, questions that I guess you asked? Okay, so in, for the IMPACT project and for the Support in Life project, mm -hmm. um, we don't ask any children. So from an ethics perspective, we don't engage directly with children at all. Mm -hmm. So our focus in the IMPACT project was the feasibility of using the tool, which was the direct user of the tool, the healthcare person. Mm -hmm. So we asked them about their use of the technology and the efficacy of the technology. In the Supporting Life project, which was a very large project, where we did a randomised control trial, um, we engaged with the parent and guardian of the child. So the ch a child is never asked any questions as part of our research. That's, that's unethical for us. That's, yeah. um, but our focus uh, in that smaller project was very much on the feasibility of mobile health rather than the clinical um, effectiveness of the tool. And actually that's one, as an information systems researcher, that's one of the challenges um, I f have found in working in multidisciplinary projects is, and we have also negotiated on this, is what research objective, what, what problem gets priority? Is it the clinical problem? Is it the information systems problem? Is it the data science problem? So how do you negotiate what problem we're trying to solve first? So, and, and certainly for the large, the, the Malawi project, it was, it was very much a clinical, the primary objective was a, was a clinical objective, but actually as information systems researcher, re, uh, researchers, it's very important for us to understand, you know, is the technology usable, useful, effective? So we need to make sure that we build these into the study design also. So I, I just want to say thank you all so much for your time. I really appreciate my invitation here. Thank you, Juan, Alex, Naria, and if, if feel free to send me an email if you have any questions or you have an idea that you think might be interesting to discuss. That would be great too. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.